Um, so today there is myself, Amy, uh, Julian Reed, and Simon Lane talking today. Uh, Julian is, um, in his own words, not a great self-publicist, and so didn't like me asking him what he wanted me to say about him. Um, but he's thoroughly enjoyed lockdown and walking the dog. Um, if you don't know his profile, that's available on the website. Uh, he's quick-witted, he's got a dry sense of humour, and he's been recommended as a leaning junior in Wales, Chester and the Western Circuit in areas of chancery, probate, tax, divorce and financial remedy. He has an ability to stay calm under pressure and to absorb detail quickly and combining an excellent knowledge of civil law with top end client service. We've got to love Julian. We've also got Simon Lane talking today. He's dressed up specially for the occasion and even had a new haircut. He's happy, kind, funny, friendly and always very approachable. Uh, his profile is on the website. He is a fully trained mediator and he is great at property law in addition to the area that we are discussing today in the context of wills, trusts and probate. Um, I'm not very good at blowing my own trumpet. I'm Amy. Um, it's not really my style to do that. Um, I am recommended in Legal 500. You all know where to look to find that. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I've presented with Simon, Simon Gore a few times. Recently, I'm uh, step qualified and um, my profile is also available on Chambers website. Without further ado, then the order of play today is going to be Julian Reed, then Amy Berry, then Simon Lane. So I hand over to Julian Reed. Thank you, Amy, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to uh, present you about the duty to disappointed or intended beneficiaries. Um, we all know a solicitor who accepts instructions holds himself out to his clients as having adequate skill and knowledge properly to conduct the business he undertakes. That duty is owed in both contract and tort, and the solicitor may be liable to a third person for the tort of negligence. The solicitor's duty survives the client's death. The estate is entitled to recover compensation in respect of losses incurred as a result of the negligence. But third parties may also bring claims against solicitors. Um, this summer, um, recent instructions have set my mind wandering, wondering how on earth solicitors get into certain problems. Um, the scenarios have been quite startling. Um, one solicitor has been executing wills for many years, which were witnessed by only one witness. Um, struck me that Section 9 of the Wills Act was a fundamental piece of knowledge. Um, solicitors who failed to address the residuary estate in wills. Another solicitor addressed only one property, but there were three properties and the residuary estate which were not addressed. Um, yesterday, despite making an attendance note on the day the testator signed a will which said if her home had been sold the net proceeds were to be divided equally between uh, two beneficiaries the will actually said if the house was sold the net proceeds should go to one beneficiary so it does strike me that solicitors get themselves into uh, a lot of problems if i may move on in the slides from the um, introductory slide just to set out some basics, the law recognises the right of beneficiaries or an intended beneficiary under a will to bring a claim against a firm of solicitors who acted for the testator. Um, the first recognition was in Ross and uh, Caunters, and then the House of Lords in White and Jones established the assumption of responsibility by a solicitor towards his client um, could be extended to intended beneficiaries. The starting point for me is taking instructions. Um, the importance of that um, task cannot be underestimated. It's sensible to have a checklist of the important issues to be considered with a client and to work meticulously through that list. It reduces the chances of important matters being overlooked. Um, courts are more likely to accept the account of a solicitor who has properly prepared a criteria to look at with a client, extensively records the instructions of a client and addresses all important and obvious issues with that client. So taking important um, procedural steps 
to safeguard against risks uh, must be the, the um, starting point. The duty um, from Ross and Quarters, in that case, a solicitor had failed to notice an important procedural defect. Um, the will had been witnessed by the spouse of a beneficiary, and it was held that solicitors owed a duty of care to that beneficiary because it was obvious that carelessness on the part of the solicitor would be likely to cause damage to her. Um, if I move on to the next um, um, the White and Jones um, slide, um, it established the um, responsibility of, of solicitors to third parties because the solicitor failed to act on the testator's instructions in time and he died before a new will could be executed. So there is an importance there that when you're in a situation where somebody is unwell or there's a need to act quickly, if you've accepted instructions, you must act quickly. Um, in both of the cases, Ross and White and Jones, the personal representatives could only recover nominal damages because the estate had suffered no loss, but the victims were the disappointed beneficiaries and they could recover. And the important passages, I think, of White and Jones, um, Lord Goff said that if such a duty is not recognised, the only persons who might have a valid claim, i.e. the testator and his estate, have suffered no loss. And the only person who has suffered a loss, i.e. the disappointed beneficiary, has no claim. If the solicitor owes no duty to the intended beneficiaries, there is a lacuna in the law which needs to be filled. I this I regard as being a point of cardinal importance in the present case. Um, the passage I've set out in the PowerPoint there, um, point three of what Lord uh, Goff had said, um, maybe it's an element of poacher turned gamekeeper, but I suspect there really is a point of public uh, policy in the decision, and it illustrates the fact that you don't want to be on the receiving end of a claim because it doesn't look as though the courts will give much sympathy to solicitors. And the point there is that if you do get sued, you, you can't have much to complain about because um, there must be reliance upon solicitors doing things properly and protecting beneficiaries. So public confidence in the legal system is what's behind the decision. Um, the point was also echoed by Lord Bram Wilkinson, where he says, to my mind, it would be unacceptable if because of some technical rules of law, the wishes and expectations of testators and beneficiaries generally could be defeated by the negligent actions of solicitors without there being any redress. Um, so the duty is owed by the solicitor, even though there's no contract uh, with the beneficiary, and even though there's no reliance by the beneficiary on the solicitor's words or actions. The reality in most cases is the beneficiary would be unaware of the terms of the will until after the testator's death. Um, but that doesn't stop a claim and it doesn't stop the solicitor owing the duty. If we could move on then to the next um, slide. There's been um, developments in a number of authorities. and I, I've set out three of them there just to illustrate um, some of the points. Um, Carglin and Fearsons is one where the solicitors failed to sever the joint um, tenancy, um, resulting in the right of survivorship operating and the gift of the testator's interest in the property um, failed to the, the, the claimant. And it was held that where a solicitor's breach of duty of care to a testator in preparing a will results in loss to the estate, a duty of care is owed to the beneficiary whose gift is rendered ineffective. Um, in Smith and Claremont Haynes, um, where the solicitor is aware of the urgency, he is liable in negligence to the intended beneficiaries if he fails to ensure the will is duly executed before the death of the testator. So it was the, the same point as in the, the earlier authorities. So you're not going to get, in my view, a great deal of, of sympathy if you put off a number of days, perhaps weeks, in dealing with something that really is um, rather urgent. And then in Walker um, and Chio Medlicott, um, solicitors failed to include a specific device in a will. The disappointed beneficiary um, had to bring rectification proceedings and exhaust that remedy 
before the negligence action could be proceeded with. That's the general rule, unless rectification proceedings are unlikely to result in a material recovery of funds. That distinction was brought in Horsfell and Haywards. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the limitations imposed upon applications under Section 20 of the Administration of Justice Act 1982 uh, and the problems that presents. Um, if I just move on to the next slide then and deal with the, the scope of the, the duty. Um, the solicitor is liable in damages even if the claim in negligence is purely for financial loss. Um, claims by disappointed beneficiaries, though, may face evidential hurdles. The beneficiary must establish that the testator intended to confer a particular testamentary benefit of which he has been deprived. Um, if there is a formal defect in the will or delay in its execution, that may not be difficult to prove. However, where there's a formal defect in the will, or um, sorry, however, where the failure consists in failing to advise the testator to adopt a, a specific testamentary disposition, the difficulty is more acute. Um, that was illustrated in a case called Walker and Medlicott. Um, the suggestion was the solicitor had failed to make a, a proper gift to a, an intended beneficiary, and the claimant called substantial body of evidence that the testatrix had intended to leave her property to the claimant but the claim was dismissed. And the, the logic behind that is that if there are proper records kept by the solicitor of what's been intended by the testator, that's all minuted and then the will is executed, it's very difficult um, to get behind those recordings. And they are there not only to show the intention of the testator, but also to protect the solicitor. In um, Re Sengelman, um, Mr. Justice Chadwick, as he then was, said, the probability that a will which a testator has executed in circumstances of some formality reflects his intentions is usually of such weight that convincing evidence to the contrary is necessary. So that illustrates the uphill task when there's proper, proper record keeping. Um, the scope of the duty is really fourfold. There are four limitations, and Clark against Bruce Lane is the authority in which Lord Justice Balcom set out those um, limitations. The first is proximity. Um, there must be a close degree of proximity between the solicitor who drafted the will and the disappointed beneficiary. Um, one starts by looking at really this, the scope of the retainer um, in that respect. The second um, limitation is the object of the transaction. The objective of the transaction must be for the benefit of the proposed beneficiary. Unless the transaction has that objective, the solicitor does not owe a duty of care to the beneficiary in relation to any advice which he gave to the testator, even if the advice were to cause a loss. Um, the third um, uh, issue is the class of potential beneficiaries. There appears to be no reason why an action could not be brought by a class of beneficiaries or by an individual beneficiary um, within a particular class. Whether solicitors become liable to indeterminate classes of beneficiaries, including persons on um, uh, and abroad unknown at the date of the testator's uh, death is very uncertain. In White and Jones, Lord Gough did say there must be boundaries to the availability of remedies in such cases. Um, but he did go on to make the point, if by chance a more complicated case should arise to test the precise boundaries of the principle in cases of this kind, that problem can await solution when such a case comes forward for decision. So the likelihood is that the class of potential beneficiaries must not be so large that it will expose the solicitors to a liability in an indeterminate amount for an indeterminate time uh, or to an indeterminate class, uh, but that has not firmly been answered by the court. The fourth point is that there is no other remedy available. The court will not impose a duty of care unless there are no other effective remedies. Um, White and Jones addressed the situation where only one person who had suffered a loss had no title to sue. 
where beneficiaries and the personal representatives have identical claims against the solicitor, the claim should be brought by the estate rather than by the beneficiaries. So there is a slight distinction there. Um, there are a, a number of authorities that have looked at that issue. Um, I, won't, I won't burden you with those at, at this stage. Um, if I move on to the next slide, damages and general um, principles. A disappointed beneficiary deprived of his inheritance may claim for the benefit under the will to which he would have been entitled if the testator's instructions had been carried out correctly. Um, in White and Jones, the Court of Appeal had awarded the beneficiaries the full amount of their legacies without a deduction for any prospect of a last minute change of heart. Um, in another case called Martin against Triggs Turner Bartons, um, Floyd J awarded the amount which would have been advanced to the disappointed beneficiary if the will had been correctly drafted, concluding that the will trustees would have advanced 50% of the available capital. Um, a beneficiary must give credit for any other benefits which the estate uh, from the estate which he would have received if the intended testamentary dispositions had taken effect. Where the estate makes a claim the general principles applicable to the assessment of damages should apply. Um, the duties imposed in White and Jones also apply to will, writer, uh, will writers. Um, there's a case called Esther Heisen against Allied Dunbar Assurance which confirms that fact. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. That's my 15 minutes for any questions, please come back to me. Um, and in the meantime, I hand over to Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next slide, please, Simon. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna give a very short talk dealing with uh, damage limitation because we're all humans and um, humans make mistakes. And therefore as lawyers, Unfortunately, that happens to us too, and mistakes do happen, um, especially in COVID, where a lot of us are a little bit stressed and a little bit frazzled with the quantity and quality of work that we're having to deal with and the emotional fallout that that has created. So I'm going to give you a talk in relation to two aspects, both of which are 10 points each. So firstly, 10 ways of avoiding professional negligence, and then secondly, 10 ways of remedying wills, trusts and deeds when you have gone wrong. Uh, on the next slide, um, we can see point one in terms of what to do to avoid professional negligence. Now, I know this seems basic, but it's really important and you would be amazed, or maybe you wouldn't, the number of cases where you see that this issue, this initial management of facts just hasn't happened. So essentially, you need to deal with your factual matrix, the background to the situation, because everything is contextual. And accordingly, it's really helpful if it, first point to avoiding professional negligence, if you deal with in two different columns, those facts that are disputed and those that are common ground. So on the next slide, we've got the second um, tip, which is to highlight any assumptions that you make while you're writing, whether that's a witness statement, an attendance note, or indeed correspondence. Because if you make an assumption, the thing that we don't wanna do is make an ass out of you and me. Um, and therefore what we need to do is ensure that we have evidence to corroborate those assumptions and they therefore becomes part of our to-do list. The third point on the next slide please Simon is that we need to make sure that our clients know what we need them to do and when they need to do it by because this is really important time frames are important and I'll come on to them on point seven as is expectation management, and I will come on to that in more detail at point eight. But also in relation to the correspondence that we write and the correspondence that we receive, we need to manage that. And we need to manage our clients' expectations in relation to that correspondence. We also need to manage the cost implications of that. We all know that delay equals further costs. And if we're dealing with third party involvement, in particular, social services record, hospital records, police records, etc. Um, we all know that we don't get that information voluntarily at all junctures, if at all. And accordingly, we have to factor into those time estimates and asking the clients what we need and when we need it, applications for disclosure in the courts. And the fourth point, Simon, on the next slide, please, 
is again looking at a paper trail and chronologies. I know that a lot of us that have been in practice a long time haven't prepared a chronology for quite a long time, but we should. It's a really useful tool and it doesn't need to be a chronology in relation to all issues. It can be a, a specific chronology in relation to a specific aspect of the facts. It can be in relation to key dates. If you're producing a core bundle, it can, produce, it can be in relation to litigation conduct um, or it can be in relation to other aspects that are relevant to costs. Again, don't always give that to the junior member of the team because sometimes their lack of understanding and appreciation because they simply haven't done it yet of the detail that would need to go into it and how it should be produced um, can be missed. In addition, dramatis personae are really helpful. Again, I don't see an awful lot of them in instructions for council um, and end up drafting them myself, which I do question sometimes whether that's cost efficient. Um, again, contemporaneous evidence is your best evidence. So in part, that is the correspondence because the correspondence shows your decision making and your thought processes if not correspondence and attendance notes. And the more detailed the attendance notes, obviously the better. And everyone says, well, I just couldn't do that at the time. Well, nobody's asking you to be perfect. What we have to do is be as best as we possibly can. And accordingly, what I always say is it can be as contemporaneous as is reasonably possible in the circumstances you find yourself. At number five, uh, Simon, please. The next important point is in relation to file management and risk assessment. Now, if you've done one to four, this is slightly much easier. Um, ultimately, you've got to find a method that works for you. All of us have different management skills. All of us are different individuals. If your firm or department doesn't have a pro forma that is useful to the work that you are doing, why not create one? Um, it's important to spend time on risk assessment. Could it be improved? Could it be honed, particular to the area that you are working with? Don't forget that you've got the Solicitor's Regulation Authority and Law Society guidance and requirements that you need to fulfill. You need to, specifically in relation to conflicts of interest, that's really important. At point six, and this is really important in relation to avoiding professional negligence, is don't step out of your comfort zone without appropriate support. I always spend time encouraging junior members of chambers and junior solicitors that they can do an area of work but only when they have the grounding to do that professional negligence is based on work or success in a professional negligence claim is based on carrying out work outside of the range of normal i.e you've conducted this piece of work in a way in which no other person would have done um, so it's much easier to stay in the range of normal and prevent a claim from, for professional negligence if you know what you are doing and you do it every day I know specialising is not always easy, but that's what council are here for to assist, um, if that is the case. Mitigation is key. The seventh point, please, Simon. And this one is really, really important. Um, and it's amazing how many times it gets missed. So know and diarise the time limits, the jurisdiction limits and the deadlines. There are a number of deadlines in relation to wills, trusts and probate relating to two years from date of death. For example, deeds of variation, writing back, um, exercising powers of appointment um, and such things. Again, there are a number of deadlines in relation to six months post grant of probate, in relation to rectification claims, in relation to 1975 Act claims. We've also got the executor's year and the expectations of HMRC in relation to tax and when penalties will arise and when interest arises. Again, those are things that you need to know if you are dealing with these um, matters on a daily basis. You've also then got the time limits and requirements of the civil procedure rules, and they're not always the same as what you think they should be, particularly when you're dealing with part 57 and part 64, because they vary a number of the standardised time limits set out in the CPR 7 and 8. You've also got the non-contentious probate rules in relation to timeframes, in relation to caveats and warnings and appearances to consider. Again, they've been amended recently, but I understand Simon Lane is going to talk to you more about that. But that's one of the really important things, and they need to be diarised. If you miss a time frame, that is a classic case for well, why did you miss that time frame? What evidence have you got to say that it wasn't your fault, it was the client's? And if you didn't advise the client in the first instance that there was a time frame and it needed to be met, that's going to be a difficult argument for you to succeed on. Paragraph uh, uh, point eight, please, Simon, on the next slide. So expectation management, well, this is just really about people skills. 
Um, it applies to clients and staff, whether they're more junior than you or more senior than you. You can't expect people just to drop everything and, and deal with the file that you've got because you found yourself in a pickle. Um, you need to give warning and you need to take advice going along the lines. Importantly, don't underestimate how much it's going to cost or the possible delays. We all have got horror stories of litigation that's gone on for years when it really shouldn't. Um, avoid over promising and therefore under delivering. Annoying clients is one surefire way of getting a professional negligence claim walking through your door. You've got to build trust and confidence. And part of that is being honest uh, in terms of the price and the costings and the delays and the time. If you're not honest and open about the variations that can occur and the ambit of discretion that you are applying to this, it won't be understood by the client. And again, that's a classic way for a professional negligence claim to find its way walking through your door. Um, point nine, please, Simon, on the next slide. Um, so these last two slides are, again, something that I'm sure you know, but it's just quite helpful putting them in a list because it's something that if you're more senior, you can give to juniors. And if you're junior, you can print out and you can put somewhere and keep, you know, so you've ticked all your boxes every day. Um, but keep your knowledge up to date. Have a good library. It's some, a conversation I remember vividly from being in pupillage. And it's so true. It doesn't necessarily cost money to have that good library but you need to know what resources you've got and the ones that you don't have and if you don't have them then ideally you need to find where those resources are available to you for free whether that is in a reference library or a university library or an inn of court or a friendly barrister um, attend webinars thank you for all of you that are attending today i think there's over 150 of you so that's good to see um, join practice groups and societies relevant to where you live and the areas of work that you do. Generally, they are relatively low cost in terms of joining and provide a, a plethora of um, opportunities for seminars, webinars and further literature. Carry out research or get somebody else to do it. Um, and again, use third parties, use friends and colleagues along the way. We've all made better contact with each other I think over lockdown because we're all forced to sit at a desk and we don't have any of the banter and the camaraderie of, of being in the office like we would like um, but use each other that's what we're there for we're all in the same boat and it's never nice having to sue a solicitor that you all know that a solicitor has been sued and the final slide in relation to professional negligence 10 top tips is to understand and read your professional indemnity insurance um, if you don't know when you have to report something and you don't know when there is discretion to report something, how do you know where those boundaries are when you don't have to do either of those things? The answer is you don't. Um, so accordingly, I know it is boring and I know it is small fine print, but you really do need to find that however junior you are. If you've got files of which you are responsible, um, even at first instance subject to an overriding partner, then you need to know where those boundaries are so that you know when you need to go into your partner's office and interrupt a meeting as opposed to just wait till he's or she has finished. So next slide, please, Simon. So the next top 10 are in relation to how can we put it right? It's gone wrong. Um, so the first one is mitigation. And this has been touched on in part by Julian on his talk in relation to professional negligence. Um, if you've got a reasonable, if you've got a disreasonable, if you've got a disgruntled client um, who ought reasonably to have avoided a loss caused by a negligent act of yourselves by accepting a remedy offered, then often a ward of damages can be mitigated. That's really important to understand, which is really again important in, in the context, particularly of don't step outside of the boundary of your area of law. Um, proving that it was unreasonable to refuse a remedy offered is not straightforward, as unfortunately lawyers suffer from the disadvantage that that argument is being advanced by the lawyer who is, but for the argument on mitigation, liable for professional negligence. So it doesn't sit very well in one's mouth. And another key point in relation to mitigation is the argument that, well, they should issue a claim. Um, and again, Julian referred to this and the case of Horsfall and Haywards in 1999 in relation to the fact that there is a duty to mitigate, but it does not go so far as to oblige the injured party, i.e. disgruntled client, even under full indemnity, to embark on complicated and difficult piece of legislation, uh, litigation against a third party. Um, so if you're in that category and there are 
issues and you need to understand what you can and can't argue and what you can and can't ask your client to do. I've pulled out three other cases. So if you've got your pens ready. So there's Horsefall and Haywards, which is in 1999, Professional Negligence Law Report, page 583. There's Walker and Medlicott in 1999, one weekly law report, 727. And a recent one, Giles versus the Royal National Institute in relation to Bert of the Blind, 2014, England Whale High Court, 1373. The next uh, slide, Simon, is in relation to, well, how do we get to the intention? We've realized that what we've written on here isn't quite what was intended. How do we fix that? Um, well, the five legal applications are alteration, erasure, correction, construction, and rectification. Now, subject to tax advice, and that really is important, um, those are the methods of trying to make a will, trust, or deed say what the testator, settler, or donor intended. So we all have heard and we know about rectification of wills under section 20. Uh, rectification of trusts and deeds has recently been in the High Court by a case by Penny Reid QC, Graham and Lynch, 2020. Um, I gave a seminar on this with Simon Gore not too long ago. Uh, and I'm sure he's got notes if you would like them in more detail. Obviously, in the hour slot, we can't go into very much. Um, but the law on rectification has been well set out in that judgment. If you are in an area where you don't think construction is going to cut the mustard and create the, uh, the outcome that you want, then your only avenue is rectification. If you are dealing with the really difficult nub of rectification, it's whether or not the rectification is as to a mistake as to effect, not a mistake as to consequence. Then in addition to reading Graham and Lynch, I really recommend that you read Alnut, uh, double L, double T, and Wilding, 2007, um, England Whale Court of Appeals, Civ 412. Uh, that was a really helpful case on, on trying to draw that line between what is uh, an effect and a consequence in relation to an order. Um, the bottom line though is be inventive and creative in relation to rectification and construction arguments in terms of lateral thinking, um, because it's much better that you do that in the context of one of these applications, which are relatively short, much shorter than any professional negligence proceedings, and therefore you avoid those professional negligence proceedings. The next option on slide three, please, Simon, is, well, you've also got the option of simply executing another will, trust or deed. Um, so this is the first point in that, is that you've got the option of statutory wills or codicils. So if someone has lost capacity, then you can make an application to the Court of Protection to execute another will, trust or deed. Tax planning, much of a misconception, is available in the Court of Protection and happens reasonably regularly. I probably do three or four cases like that a year in the Court of Protection. Um, I don't think I've ever actually appeared in the Court of Protection, so it's all gone through, uh, appeared in relation to those cases in the Court of Protection. So they've all gone through on paper. In relation to whether or not someone has capacity, then obviously it's a lot easier. You simply execute a new code, so will, trust or deed. The next slide, point four, is uh, what can you do if they have died? Well, if you are within the two years, you can do a deed of variation that can revert back to date of death subject to what is set out in those two sections, section 142 and section 62. Um, there is a misconception that because the two years has expired, a deed of variation is not valid. That is wrong. A deed of variation is valid. It simply won't have the effect for tax, i.e. it won't be written back to the date of death. The implications of that meaning that under the will trust or, or deed, the original beneficiary under that initial document will be the gift or for the purposes or the donor for the purposes of that variation. So there might be tax implications, which is why I say earlier in relation to doing things, it's subject to tax. There are also the opportunity of using a disclaimer. And I have to say these are, are, are consistently underused in the context of wills, trusts and probate. Uh, and they can amount to um, a very similar process to a deed of variation. Um, one of the main reasons, and certainly something that I'm doing quite a lot of at the moment, is some tax planning post-death in relation to ensuring that residence nil rate band and or 36% rate 
of inheritance tax on taxable estates is claimed. So the next slide is um, a nice little uh, illustration to show that if someone has died after the 5th of April 2012, and if 10% or more of their taxable estate is given to charity, the rate of inheritance tax is reduced to 36%. Um, what it doesn't say in the rules, but actually is the case, is that actually if you give more than 4% of your taxable estate to charity, it is worth giving 10%. So this is a chart that you really need to have if you're um, considering trying to deal with professional negligence and mitigating the losses and the gains to the respective clients, because ultimately what they want at the end of the day is the money that they think they should have. Um, so in this scenario, if somebody dies with an estate of 625,000 and the only allowance they are allowed is a nil rate band of 325,000, this therefore leaves a taxable estate of 300,000. If you give 30,000 to charity and the rest to family, non-spouse, this is 10% of the taxable estate. So the inheritance tax on the remaining 270,000 is 36%, meaning 97,200 pounds, which would leave the children with the 497,800 4, pounds, which is the 625,000 we start with, minus the 30,000 that's gone to, ch to the charity, minus the tax bill of 97,000. If we give the charity only 12,000 and the rest of the family, i.e. 4% of the estate, um, that is 12,000 pounds over the 300,000. So the inheritance tax on the remaining 288,000 is 40%, so 115,200 pounds, leaving the family with 497 pounds 800, i.e. exactly the same because in this case, we take away from the 625,000, the 12,000 pounds plus the 115,200 pounds. It's a really useful illustration of how we get to the same point. Essentially, if you ever have a will where somebody has gifted five, between four and 10% of the estate to charity, you need to screw it up and throw it in the bin and rewrite it because they are doing a disservice to themselves. Next slide, please, Simon. So I'm conscious of time, and I knew I would be uh, very close to it, bearing in mind I've got a 15 minute slot or thereabouts. So I've clumped together four other avenues that are open to you in trying to mitigate and think outside the box in relation to professional negligence in relation to will states and trusts. So there are also declarations of beneficial ownership to third parties and the Trust of Land and Appointment of Trustees Act. You have the opportunity of making appointments under discretionary trusts. Again, if they are made within two years, there is scope for bringing them back to the date of death of the deceased for tax reasons. There are lots of options in relation to short term trusts. I could fill a day with talking about that. And so I can't cover that in any detail today. But you have my email address if you want to email. You also have claims under the Inheritance Provisions and Family Dependence Act 1975. And again, I could spend more than a day talking about the implications of that. Um, but again, they're avenues that are open to you. And if you are floundering because you've made a mistake and realise that there are things that you need to do, then those are the sort of things that you should start thinking about when mulling over what you can do in the situation you find yourself. So the last two um, points, nine and ten, are both the statutory tools, which I find are really poorly underused, which is such a shame because they're such important tools. So one is section 15 of the Trustee Act 1925, which permits personal representatives or two or more trustees or a sole acting trustees where authorised by the instrument creating the trust or by statute, i.e. where it's not inconsistent with the terms of the trust. Um, two, do all of those things A to F. The most commonly used one is to compromise. So you can compromise any claim. You don't need the beneficiary's consent. There is much dispute and debate in the White Book and amongst practitioners as to the extent to which um, 1975 Act claims can be compromised in this way. Um, at the moment, the perceived um, agreed position in relation to practitioners, I haven't checked the new White Book, um, I've had other things to do since lockdown, I'm afraid, um, is that in relation to 75 Act claims, if the totality of the estate that you're seeking to redirect pursuant to the 75 Act 
is held in a discretionary trust, then you can do that pursuant to Section 15 of the Trustee Act by the personal representatives. Uh, it's being a matter for the personal representatives thereafter on how to deal with that. The last slide is in relation to Section 57 of the Trustee Act 1925. And it says that where in the management or administration of any property vested in trustees, any sale, lease, mortgage, surrender, release, or other disposition, or any purchase, investment, acquisition, expenditure, or other transaction is in the opinion of the court expedient, but the same cannot be effected by reason of the absence of any power for that purpose vested in the trustees by the trust instrument, if any, or by law, the court may by order confer upon the trustees, either generally or in any particular instance, the necessary power for the purpose on such terms and subject to other, to such other provisions and conditions, if any, as the court may think fit and may direct in what manner any money authorised to be expended and the costs of any transaction are to be paid or borne between capital and income. Well, that's a bit of a mouthful. So what I will do is I will simply give you, if you've got your pens ready, I will give you the cases that you need to look at in relation to this section if you think it might be helpful in the situation you find yourself at. Firstly, you want to have a look at Ree Downshire Settled Estate 1953, 1 Chancery 216. It's a court of, of appeal case and it considered the scope of section 57 at paragraph or page even 248. The next case that considered it is um, Alexander and Alexander, 2011 Wills and Trust Law Report 187 and Re the Portman Estate 2015 England and Wales High Court 536 Chancery at paragraph 15. Most recently was a case by Richard, Richard Drew, uh, Gelber and Sunderland Foundation in 2018, England and Wales High Court 2344. Again, it's really underused and it shouldn't be. It gives a really broad discretion to deal with changing the powers under the terms of a will, trust or deed which is really helpful when you're trying to squirm your way out of a professional negligence proceedings. So thank you very much for listening and watching me on the last slide. And I now, next slide please, Simon, thank you. Um, I now hand over to Mr. Lane, who's just unmuted his mic and his film is coming and he's gonna give you uh, our rest of the seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, so in this section, uh, we deal with uh, avoiding uh, negligence and uh, managing risk in the context of the administration of estates. Uh, as with most aspects of practice, there's always an element of risk management, uh, leaving aside the reputational harm and embarrassment of having to deal with claims, the cost in terms of time and stress on practice can be enormous. Uh, this will also have an impact on uh, PII insurance. Of course, many of you will have renewed that uh, this last month. Um, it's particularly so in the context of administration of estates, given that that heady mix of death, relatives, money, and therefore managing risk and avoiding claims requires some navigation and a robust and business-like approach to risk management. Uh, this is also important, of course, in the context of complaints handling uh, within the firm. Um, as far as uh, uh, personal representatives are concerned, uh, they can be exposed to three main areas of risk. First is having to compensate uh, trusts or estate uh, whether actions have caused loss to the estate liabilities for penalties and costs which have uh, which cannot be recovered from the assets of the estate uh, and that might be long after the assets have been distributed uh, the third is damage to professional reputation and client uh, um, uh, relations so in terms of uh, risk uh, management and if i can take you to uh, uh, slide three um, as has been uh, 
set out quite neatly by both uh, Amy and um, by uh, Julian. Uh, risk management requires uh, a consistent uh, structural and institutional approach to rather than dealing with it on a case by case uh, basis. Um, so uh, the risk to the PR can be split into three areas. Uh, those that are inherent under that's on um, under slide four, those are inherent in being in a business as a professional generally. Uh, so general civil law, uh, criminal law uh, and the general law, uh, professional obligations and regulatory requirements, uh, things such as competition, data protection and uh, management, uh, disaster management in terms of information and con continuation, uh, employment, uh, vicarious liability for one's employees, and of course, financial management. Um, so as a PR, uh, as a personal representative, there are specific responsibilities as a legal owner of the assets. And one of the things, or some, a number of the things that are, are set out on slide five, uh, the legal responsibility, for example, of safety of others, uh, in relation to those assets, including occupiers, employees, visitors. That's not limited to health and safety, but it could also include environmental considerations, uh, regulation and the sale and purchase of assets. Uh, that obviously includes the general law, property law, insider trading, taxation and things of that nature. Uh, responsibility for continued ownership, for example, uh, enforcement of title, possession, there may be squatters on the land, um, the incidence of landlord and tenants, so obligations as far as uh, being a landlord is concerned, uh, and uh, insurance and insurable risks. So there are a number of uh, uh, issues, and if you turn to slide six, please, Simon. Um, there are a number of issues that are specific to being uh, a personal representative or uh, trustee. Um, and so the law specific to being a pers uh, personal representative or trustee um, regard will obviously be had in the very first instance to section 25 of the Administration of Estates Act, the need to get in and administer the estate according to law. Uh, but of course, there are specific issues in relation to taxation uh, negligence uh, and uh, needing to be aware of uh, the potential uh, of the need to conduct litigation and the firm's capacity to do that. So uh, as has been suggested uh, it follows that a planned approach is required uh, with regard to uh, the firm's policies uh, and development of these uh, control, control structures within the firm uh, training and compliance. So without those in place, it becomes significantly more difficult to anticipate, avoid uh, and deal with risk uh, when dealing with uh, those uh, estates. Um, risk management approach is required, uh, a risk management approach is required when considering taking on new business generally. Uh, I think we're on um, slide seven, Simon, I do apologise. Uh, the starting point is that the firm and individuals are competent to carry out the likely work that's required. Um, if new business is of a size and complexity that hasn't been handled before, uh, an evaluation of the skills and systems in place it is likely to be necessary. And in the absence of a risk assessment uh, in relation to that, it will be difficult to determine in relation to this new work, whether it uh, falls within uh, the boundaries of acceptable risk. So um, if there is a failure uh, to produce or have any risk assessment, uh, that clearly uh, increases the level of potential list, uh, of, of potential risk. And um, it, in an absence of that is an indicator towards uh, negligence in any event. Um, so if I can take you to slide uh, eight, please, there is an obligation 
uh, as far as uh, professionals are concerned when taking on new work, the SRA Code of Conduct sets out uh, the need for uh, competence, uh, delivering these things in a timely and uh, uh, competent manner, uh, and needing to bear in mind the client's attributes, needs and circumstances, uh, and, enjoy, and ensuring that there is uh, a structure in place under 4.3 uh, of the uh, Code of Conduct Rules, uh, and then ensuring that there is adequate system or effective system uh, for supervising so often when dealing with the administration of estates, the question of competence is not capable of being resolved fully at the outset because you simply don't know uh, what is happening uh, beneath the surface of the estate. So some of those difficulties may not become apparent until there has been investigation. Um, so some issues uh, can often arise during the course of administration, such as litigation difficulties with particular assets, and as time goes on, the conflict between beneficiaries and non-professional personal representatives can become apparent. So harking back to what has been said by um, uh, Amy and Julian throughout, there needs to be adequate documentation. Parag um, slide nine, um, I deal with the standardised approach to the taking on of new business and risk. And I've identified here uh, standardised checklists and key questions that need to be asked um, and that recording that information is an early stage um, so that issues can be flagged up at the earliest opportunity and that there can be greater scrutiny of the work being carried out on the firm's behalf. If a standardised procedure is not adopted then a firm will be relying on the individual taking on the new business to have sufficient knowledge to cover all of the areas needed remember all of the issues to be need to be covered and record the information so it can be read and understood by anyone who has to work on the file. So um, as Amy has said, chronologies are incredibly important, whether it's for particular issues or of the file as a whole, bearing in mind uh, often that the file will need to be handed over to uh, different people throughout the course of the administration. Um, similarly, with uh, or in a similar way to the administration of trusts, it, it's often sensible to have an administration diary uh, available. Uh, and I can't recommend enough uh, having, especially when there are complexities and a number of beneficiaries for the file to have uh, a list of people, key people, or dramatis personae um, involved uh, at, under the front cover of the file. So particular issues that need to be covered uh, under slide 10, I've identified um, dealing with the de deceased first, um, considering their domicile, a number of issues, of course, will flow from that. Um, uh, personal details, including their marital or civil partnership status, because that may have an effect on wills, as we will see in due course, need to consider whether they have or enjoy any trusteeships, um, whether they have a power of attorney or were a deputy. Um, they may in themselves have been an executor or personal representative, and that may have an impact uh, on the chain of representation. Uh, turning to slide 11, um, need to bear in mind uh, particular issues in relation to the family and beneficiaries, personal details, including a family tree. Uh, can't stress the importance of the family tree uh, particularly in complex uh, cases enough, uh, so dealing with divorces, dependents and the like, and that will identify or at least help identify potential claims or inconsistencies when compared to the will and whether other potential beneficiaries may have died. Um, consideration under uh, slide 12, the death certificate, um, uh, so that will help assist in identifying whether there may have been a potential accident, injury, illness, potential claims and statutory schemes that may be available. Uh, if sadly there's been a suicide, there may be an in impact on insurance policies. Hom homicide, of course, uh, the question of uh, forfeiture issues uh, that uh, may arise and uh, importantly the question of the assets, given the extent of the assets, uh, registration of title, 
investment risks versus the potential benefit for the estate and also whether investment decisions may need to be made uh, imminently. So um, that continues on to slide 13. Um, and um, so one has to consider the availability of assets and their security, uh, whether they're insured and whether there's adequate insurance, uh, nature of the assets and whether the firm is competent to deal with this and the availability and cost of advice for the management of that. For example, uh, there may be industry specific issues ranging from uh, Japanese knotwood, uh, contamination, agricultural land, and perhaps there may be issues over compulsory purchase or other planning issues. Um, moving on to slide 14, um, the location of the assets might be uh, important. For example, there may well be jurisdictional issues uh, with foreign property. Um, I've seen particularly in recent cases, assets where there have been assets in uh, the Republic of Ireland, as well as in uh, England and Wales, uh, and also in Spain. Um, also, we'll need to consider the liquidity of, of assets. Um, moving on to, uh, still on 14, in fact, um, consideration of debts, uh, size and extent of those debts and establishing whether the estate is in fact uh, solvent. Uh, thinking along the lines of debts such as credit cards, uh, nursing home fees, uh, have these on slide 15, have those debts uh, been truly incurred in relation to the estate um, or by others? Um, and we need to consider the order of priority in which and when those uh, when those debts can be paid. Uh, funding the payment of debts if there is a single principal asset such as a house, a farm or a business is clearly important. Um, moving on, um, slide uh, 16, the will. Um, Amy's already referred and uh, Julian to the validity and checking that the formal validity of the will has in fact uh, been complied with under the Wills Act. Um, we'll need to consider that in relation to what is known about the deceased, whether they had any capacity issues, uh, whether there may have been a subsequent marriage or divorce or uh, children, um, and subsequent wills or codicil. All of those things need to be considered. Uh, other issues relate to, of course, um, the question of litigation. Um, the deceased may have been involved in litigation as a party, um, perhaps even in relation to a pension or something of that nature, um, or even a personal injury claim. Uh, so there may be existing litigation, which is the personal representatives need to consider whether to continue or to settle and what to do about that. Um, one also needs to consider the funding of that, uh, the viability of the claim in light of the deceased's uh, lack of evidence or ability to give evidence, and also potential conflicts of interest that arise in particular litigation if it's being conducted by the firm already. So claims arising during the course of the administration such as 1975 Act claims and of course the duty to act neutrally uh, between uh, particular beneficiaries. So moving on to um, paragraph, sorry not paragraph, slide 18. Um, what's also been dealt with previously, I think in part by, um, by Amy, uh, need to consider issues relating to lifetime gifts and other dispositions, uh, the availability of various different relief and tax planning, and also deceased tax returns uh, and the need for deed of variations and things of that nature. Uh, finally, in terms of managing the risk at the, at the initial stage, of course, the retainer is incredibly important to ensure that you as the, uh, as the uh, professional person acting on behalf of the estate uh, is not bound to deal with unacceptable uh, risks in your own conduct. So it should, um, in the absence of um, proper instructions, uh, allow you to uh, terminate those instructions uh, in due course. So I'm conscious that um, in terms of time, I've taken up quite a bit of your time um, there's plenty more that we could discuss in terms of drilling down to some of the uh, the details, but I hope that uh, given 
uh, the outline there that gives you an idea of some of those things in particular that need to be taken into account uh, when assessing and managing risk particularly in the initial stages of taking on uh, cases uh, and the administration of estates and how to deal with things as they arise. So unless I can assist any further. Thank you very much Simon. Thank you everybody for listening. Um, just something I've noticed that I should have said at the beginning. Um, Simon, Sean Collum and Simon Gore, I'm not sure who, will be sending out the slides in the chat box. I think they're already there so if you want to download those before you go you're very welcome. Um, in addition, Sean Collum, our marketing manager, will be sending out notes and a recording when it's been edited uh, and thank yous for all attendees. And I also understand they will be uploaded on the Chamber's website. If you've got any questions, um, because we've run out of time, I think it's best if you email them. We had one question um, before today in relation to what is the limitation period for claims that wills are invalid. There isn't really a straightforward answer to that, but it's sort of this. Um, time limit to bring probate claims is governed by part 57. There is no statutory limitation period. It's an equitable jurisdiction. So you have to balance prejudice against delay. Um, it's very difficult practically to dispute um, a will once probate has been granted and the estate administered. So from a practical perspective, you best get your skates on but if you're well after the event, take advice. Um, in terms of some other deadlines, because it, the question of invalidity of wills could be quite broad. If you're wanting to revoke probate, you've got six months. If you don't do it within the six months in exactly the same way as if you don't apply to rectify and exactly the same way if you don't apply to bring a 75 Act claim in that six month period as well, you've got to essentially satisfy the guidelines set out in re-salmon in 1981 Chancery 167 as to a good reason for an extension of time. Uh, if you are, are simply after a share of the estate or an interest in it, then you want to have a look at section 22 of the Limitation Act 1980, and that gives you 12 years to make that claim. But again, the longer you leave it, the harder it will be. So thank you all for listening. If um, I'd like to see you all again in the future, hopefully we can meet in person one day. Thank you, goodbye. <laughs>